welcome to our 26th episode of Black Dance Stories and our month of stories by performers, educators. Here's a note about why we're here. Our dance world was pummeled by COVID-19 and Black dance artists are finding ways to talk about life during this time. Our world was further turned upside down after horrible events ensued nationally and globally, bringing attention yet again to the need for the Black Lives Matter movement. Black dance artists have not been quiet since. Black dance artists have been doing the work. Black dance artists continue to make work. To stay involved, we hold these weekly impromptu discussions and tell stories. Black dance stories. This is one action and we will stay involved. We are a community working together to support, uphold, highlight, and celebrate Black creatives. Tonight is our 26th episode of what we hope will be many stories told in the artist's own voice. Tonight, it's Sharon Miller, Princess Moon, and Dr. Sandra Burton's turn. Please meet some of our BDS team, and I will go first. I am Charmaine Warren. I am a Jamaican. I am the granddaughter of Ida Boyd, granddaughter of Solomon Golson and Ruby Chapman, and one of nine children by Theophilus Warren and my 95-year-old mother, Perlene Warren, who is spry and lives in Jamaica. I am a non-disabled Black woman. With the utmost respect to the native people, I acknowledge that I live on the stolen land of the indigenous Lenape people, now known as Montclair, New Jersey, with my husband, photographer and graphic artist, Tony Turner. Our daughter, Ashe Turner, a black ballerina with locks, is in her junior year at Boston Conservatory. I have locks that are wrapped on top of my head in a colorful gale. I'm wearing a gray turtleneck and large brown adinkra earrings. Behind me are photos of our family, a large plant, a lamp, and African masks. Happy Black Dance Stories Thursday, y'all. Yeah. Welcome to our old and new friends, and we can't wait to see you all in the chat carrying on and watch out for these educators. I almost used an expletive, but I won't. <laughs> and also to the special people that the artists, the friends, the community activators on and off screen who always say yes when we reach out and ask. We are humbled. I turn it over to Kimani. Thank you, Charmaine. Number 26, come on now. Yes, welcome y'all. As you know how I love to start in the words of Decibella Grimes' mama, Gloria Grimes. Delicious, delightful dancing night. Yes, especially with these amazing educator performers. The importance of acknowledging our familial and dance legacies is an essential tradition. With deep respect and honor, I want to acknowledge the Lenny Lenape people whose stolen land I am zooming from, currently known as the village of Harlem. I am a, non, a black non-disabled woman and I live with my nine-year-old son. Oh, 10, I keep forgetting, he just turned 10. 10-year-old 10 son, I am sitting in my dining room I have a golden low cut hairstyle. I'm wearing black long sleeve shirt and always with my large BDS silver hoop earrings. I am the granddaughter of Lucille Madison, English professor. I teach because of her. Daughter of Ronald Augustus Fowlin, Jamaican warrior and gourmet chef. And Anne Fowlin, rebel and Renaissance woman. I because of them. My son Tamayo, keeps me present and I am in awe of this young man, young boy turning into man, blossoming young visual artist. And with that, I turn it over to Makada. Hi, my name is Makada. Full name, Makada Lily in Wabun Cozy, Marthy Rose Roni. I am a non-disabled black indigenous American woman pronouns, she, her, hers, and also identify with they in acknowledgement of my ancestors and spirit team that is all around me and that is also me. 
I come from a long generational line of artists and energetic intuitives on both my maternal and paternal lines, the Love Roni lines. Great granddaughter of Marguerite and Winfield Scott Chapman, maternally, and Wallace Roney Sr. and Rosette Roney, paternally, I think I said <laughs> maternally, paternally. Rosette Roney, who's still alive at 104 years old. Granddaughter of Juanita Arlene and Edward Love, maternally, and Wallace Garnett Roney Jr. and Roberta Majet, paternally. Daughter of Mia Love and Antoine Roney, sister of Kojo Roney, Zipporah Roney, and Turquoise Love, and so much more. I acknowledge that I'm, li I'm living on the land of Earth. Which, is once, which was once respectfully and harmoniously occupied by the Lenape people, now known as Harlem, New York, where I was also raised. I am a life, body, soul alchemist in which I turn into what we call art, poetry, whatever else my soul is called to channel and express the love, light, and truth. I am sitting in my loft, bedroom. Behind me are a medley of different plants. I'm sitting on a love seat couch. I am wearing a turtleneck tank top, which is black and white stripes with a pearl necklace. I have my hair out and loud and curly um, and whooshed to one side. <laughs> and then I'm going to turn it over back to Kimani. Thank you, Makada. Um, I love the whoosh. <laughs> so, I, whoosh. And I want to say first, we are always interested in growing our family. So if there is anyone interested in working for us, young Black creatives, please get in touch with us. I want to also say if you haven't joined our mailing list, please do consider. And we will have our link tree in the chat. I also want to quickly say some of our uh, team that is not here tonight on camera. We have Cynthia Tate, publicist, Renee Redding Jones, director of finance and development, Tony Turner, graphic designer, Gabe Decaladanu, BDS website designer. Please check it out. Please check it out. Caitlin Chandler, video tech expert. Antonio Burkett, ASL interpreter. And our interpreters here, Jessica, Kenya, and Sharuk. We have uh, Macaroni, uh, our producer, Makeda Smith, digital media director. And we have the, the rest. We have our um, consultants and Kojo Roney and Everett Saunders that did our drums and theme music. The list is growing and we love it. So with that, I turn it back to Makada. Yes. And like you were just saying, community is such a big part uh -huh. of stories. We love it. So we want to know who's watching tonight. Drop mm. some comments in the chat. Say hello, where you're watching from. Uh -huh. And feel free to just engage and share some love. Also, please follow us on our social media. Our Instagram is at Black Dance Stories. Our Twitter is at BLK Dance Stories. And most importantly, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. We have a huge goal of making it to a thousand subscribers and we're getting there. We can't do that without your help and your community. So please yeah. subscribe, follow us and share with your community. We now have a subscriber Sunday. So look out for that on our social media, a day where we will be illuminating our amazing community and encouraging oh. more people to be a part of our growing community. Make sure to like this video, comment on this video, like I said, spread some love. It is up to your interactions to make this happen. So without a further ado, everyone, grab yourself some water, wine, tea, your cup of love and happy, and yes. let's cheers to Black Dance Stories. 
Cheers. And I'm turning it back to you, Kimani. Thank you. Um, as always, we stay vigilant. So our BDS team will continue to stand in solidarity with our sisters and brothers all over the world. For sure. With all those who want an immediate end to systemic racism, please do your part. Don't stay silent. And with that, I turn it over to Charmaine. Thank you, Kimani. Yes, y'all, stay with us, be with us, support us, and love up on us, because we're loving up on you. <laughs> Makira and Kimani is going to be back later on, and tonight it's new for us. This is three guests in one night, so there might be a little bit of clunkiness here and there, but I know you love us, so you'll be here for us. And wow, what a pleasure it is to introduce Sharon Miller. Miss Sharon. Come on in. Thank you for having me. Hello. There you are. Oh, it's so welcome. You. Introduce yourself. We're here for you. Well, I'm Sharon Miller, and um, I was born 76 years ago in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I am here in the stolen land, which I have now discovered from the intro uh, of the Lenape people in Montclair, New Jersey. I am thrilled to be able to describe everything in the room in which I'm sitting because having started a school myself, I um, realized that there's something called the Americans with Disabilities Act which requires a great deal of interpretation, both for visually impaired and auditory impairment. So I will describe that I have gray, silver hair. I wear glasses. I am wearing mother of pearl dangly earrings. And I'm not quite sure what color my sweater is. It's either purple or periwinkle blue. I am sitting in my dining room with a mirror behind me. And I think I'm seeing a bottle of something, which I don't drink, but there's a bottle of something there. Um, I am living in my home with my daughter who is 33 years old and her daughter who is two and a half, the love of my life, whose name is Jubilee. My daughter's name is Jamie. And I am so thrilled to be here. Um, I don't know where to begin other than at my birth in Washington, DC. Um, my mother used to say, she thinks the babies got changed in the hospital because my mother was an educator and I was this creative artist that she just didn't know what to do with. Uh, fortunately, years ago, um, they discovered that I had what they call fallen arches and knock knees. And I probably would have been disabled. And I am actually not a disabled person at this point in my life, so happily. But the remedy for that was to break, believe it or not, one's arches and reset them. And my mother, of course, said, absolutely not. What is the alternative? The alternative was simple. Give her ballet lessons. Well, this African-American child, who at that point was about four years, three, three four years old, um, in ballet school just didn't make sense, but it made better sense than breaking my arches. So Mildred Spain, who was my mother, and may she rest in peace, remarried, and I ended up coming to New Jersey, which is how I ended up in Montclair, and discovered that there was a school called Garden State Ballet, and it was in Newark, New Jersey. I was only there to correct my arches. Who knew I was going to, first of all, love it 
and secondly, have any kind of ability within it. But again, as an African-American young woman, and at that child time, I was a child, I didn't know that there should be restrictions. I didn't know that there were body images that were pertinent to ballet dancing. I just knew it was something I loved and I trained in it and I loved the training. So with that said, I grew up and I started to develop. And again, that's not a ballet body. But fortunately, Garden State Ballet had the wisdom to bring in other teachers. So my first other teacher was Joyce Trisler, who introduced me to the whole Horton technique. And I loved off the ballet slippers. I took off the point shoes and my feet said, yes, thank you, God. And I discovered modern. I was also introduced to Penny Frank. So I was trained in Graham. And again, tractions, release, contract, release. That's what I remember. That's what I loved. But again, it was barefoot. And that was ideal for me. And when I was about, I guess, 12 years old, I I knew of Alvin Ailey, but I, I knew of Arthur Mitchell first, but Alvin Ailey had a company called the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. And because I was studying in dance in Newark, the Ailey company came to the Robert Treat Hotel. I remember this vividly. And they did a master class and I was in heaven. This was, for me, that was a defining moment. I said to my mother after that class, I'm gonna be in that company. And she went, yeah, sure. All right, you're gonna be a teacher. And I went, no, you're an educator. I'm a dancer. <laughs> and so as we went on in that day, I thought I had been trained by Joyce Trisler. I was only 12, but I knew what I was doing. And that's one of those things about educating people and having them come and say, I knew what a spiral sit was. I knew what a lateral was. I saw it, they did it. And you go, all right, I'm making headway. Well, years later, I was 18 and it was time to leave the nest. My mother, again, being an educator, my father wasn't in the picture because he left when I was about two um, and he remarried and he stayed in Washington, D.C. And I ended up staying with my mom. So I was in Montclair, New Jersey. My mother insisted that I go to college because I don't think she saw there was a possibility of me being an independent person providing myself with food, clothing, and shelter, which she always said, all those three, three things in that order, food, clothing, shelter, you had to be able to do that. So our compromise was that I auditioned for Juilliard. And wonderfully, I was accepted and got a scholarship. And that allowed me to move to New York. My mother used to call that, um, Sin City, but no more Sin City than any other city, I don't think. But I went to Juilliard and at Juilliard, there was another dynamic to my training, which was Jose Limon. So we had the Limon training, we had the Graham training, but we didn't have Horton. So I was kind of missing that since that was part of what I was raised as but I had Anthony Tudor as my ballet teacher. I had Margaret Kras, Cor um, Corvino. The entire Graham faculty was our, they were our teachers, Donnie McHale. And with that, once you make those kinds of, I guess you would call them friendships, mentorships, I was able to start with 
Donnie McHale's company. We did games, we did Rainbow Around My Shoulder, all these wonderful classic pieces. But then what I ended up doing was auditioning for Alvin Ailey. I didn't expect to get into the company because there were people already there like Judith Jamison, whom I thought was brilliant, Dudley, Dudley Williams, uh, Calvin Rotardier. These were names that I had learned to appreciate their style of dancing, their dedication to dancing, their ability to teach dancing. And I was auditioning for a company that they were already part of, not to mention Alvin Ailey himself. Unbeknownst to me, first try, I got into the company. I was so thrilled. I, I, I was beside myself. I think my mother was beside herself too because we were going to be touring Africa, the United States, Europe, and I would be gone for about a year or two or more. I hadn't been separated that long from my mother who was an amazing woman. Um, and she was raised by an amazing woman who was actually her grandmother who had an eighth grade education and was one generation, I believe, removed from slavery. It was an amazing person who had such wisdom, who said to me, girl, you go and dance your, well, she said, but, but behind off and enjoy the experience, learn all that you can. And that's what I did. It was just, it was awe-inspiring to, for me in particular, to go to Africa and to be walking the street and not see a predominantly white group of people coming toward me, but in essence, everyone looked like me. And that was such a, it was a feeling of belonging in a strange kind of way. And what I remember most was we thought we, the company, we thought we were African-American. And I think back then it was Afro-American, but we've gone from being black to being colored, to being Negroes, to be, I don't know. It, it, but whatever it was then, they thought of us solely as American, which I thought was really kind of an interesting phenomenon. But for us, it was really feeling a sense of belonging. We went, oh, I think it was seven countries in Africa, and we went to Israel, we went to Sweden, to Germany, to Portugal. To, it was just, it was a discovery for me of the world. I really, really grew as a human being then. Coming back was a little difficult because it was the 60s, and it was a time of great unrest, which sort of mirrors what's happening now. It was 1968, I remember we were doing the United States tour. And we were, I believe, in Pennsylvania, I'm a university there. And it was the same night that Martin Luther King was shot. And I remember thinking, we probably will not do this performance. But Alvin Ailey, in his wisdom, said, uh, we are here because of what Martin Luther King Jr. has done, because of our ability to rise above and to say, we are deserving. We are, we are artists. This is what we do. He died for our cause, for us to be able to do that. It was the best performance we ever, ever did. It was so full of feeling, real, honest to goodness feeling. And if you've seen Revelations, and I'm sure most of you have, it has such an impact. And when you're looking at it, and when you're doing it, I remember in Africa, I used to think, isn't it amazing 
how we can go from country to country and the emotion that is derived from viewing revelations is the same. And yet we are African-American predominantly. We are dancing to, to Negro spirituals and to gospel songs in a language that they don't necessarily understand. And yet they're feeling it. They're feeling what we feel. We are communicating through dance. And that was for me the time that dance became the most important passion in my life. How I ended up as an educator, I, <laughs> I'm going to blame my mother up in heaven. She always Guess wanted what, me to be Ms. Sharon. <laughs> I, you know, you know, it's time. I know. Isn't that horrible? I, this part I don't love. But it's time to bring princess in, but you all can have more. Well, we'll more talk, I'm better. sure, about education. I'm sure you will. Here's princess. Hi, hello, princess. Hello, hello, hello. All right, Bye. see you later, Sharon. Bye, Sharon. Welcome, princess. Introduce yourself. Oh, I am Princess Nifer. Kimura Ra'atan Moon. That is a mouthful, I know. I'll tell you all about it in a second. <laughs> I am sitting at home in my home office in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is just right outside of Washington, D.C., on the stolen land of the, the Lenape, the Nanticoke, the Piscataway, the Kanoi, the Powhatan, the Akahanak, the Shawnee, the Sahuahanak, the Tutelo, and the Sapani. My homeland is Chicago, the stolen land of Patawani, Adawa, Souk, Ojibwa, Illinois, Kikapu, Miami, Muscatatan, and so many more. I pay homage to the people to the tribes, to the spirits of the lands that have given me so much. My cup runneth over. My name is Princess. I'm a mother of three <laughs> from the south side of Chicago. My oldest, her name is Tashi, Amy Lynn Cooper, right? Give her an African first name and an American middle name so she can get a job if she needs to. T. Amy Lynn Cooper. She submits her resume online, but she is Tashi, the prosperous one. My second born is Akili Clifford Cooper. He's 14. He can be a Clifford Cooper if you need him to be in America, but he is Akili, common sense in Kiswahili. And my youngest is Tandy Olivia Cooper. She can be T. Olivia Cooper if you need her to be. Or Tandy, the uh, little girl vivacious and full of laughter. I'm a mother of three. Um, I am an artist. I'm so many things like all of us, right? So we could all have a resume or a curriculum vitae. I'm a daughter, I'm a sister. I'm a dance teacher, I'm a choreographer, I'm a director, I'm a writer, I'm a scholar. I have an amazing man in my life, so I'm a lover and I'm a friend. So I, we're, we're, we're so many things, right? And I like, to, I like to think, and I do think I kind of have nine lives. I like to cook soul food dinners, but I like to go to the chicken shack and get some fried food too. I love to dress up and be vintage and Harlem and just old elegance. And I love to be around the way because I'm a South Side girl. Right now I'm wearing a black turtleneck with hoop earrings, with rhinestones and a paper boy fedora hat that has red plaid with jeans that are ripped out and my, my little at home scrunchy socks. In the background I have hanging an African burlap fabric <clears throat> that has colors of brown and beige and black that I got, <clears throat> that I picked up in Zambia doing a one woman show. 
There are two pillows with beautiful graphic faces that I picked up in Dubai and two zebra brown and black chairs that I have from a previous life in a previous marriage where I owned a furniture store and did interior design. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, life is like a box of chocolates. There's so many options. You just like, what do you pick? What do you choose? And I choose happiness. I choose joy. I choose color. I choose uh, diversity, diversity of ideas, diversity of thinking, diversity of emotions, diversity of fashion, diversity of everything you can think of. I was born in 1976, the year of the bicentennial, which was the 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in Chicago during the Black Arts Movement. That was when Black people said, okay, we love ourselves, okay? I love my round lips. I love my brown skin. I love my kinky hair. I love the continent from which I came and mixed and mingled, right? I was born in that time. My mother was a teen mother, ran away from home when she was 16, shaved her head, her name was Amy Mary Moon, Amy Mary Moon. That last name, we don't know what it is. It could be Native American and it was Moon. It could be Irish and it was Mahone and it changed over time. My father was born Eugene Fulton. He changed it to Twaku, then Ikeo Lushango Bumi. Very, very, very much both of them into the Black Arts Movement and so that's where I come from. But I also come from uh, my grandparents, old school Southern Black folk, bougie entrepreneurs. Okay, we're talking about my grandfather, who was one of the only entrepreneurs in Arlington, Tennessee, to own and operate a convenience store to serve the Black community. He was a bootlegger. Okay, if the Klan didn't burn it, burn his businesses down and threaten to kill him, he would be a hen a Ford. You understand? If they didn't set those booby traps. So I have this kind of right lane, right brain, left brain thing. And people who know me um, will probably say you can't really put me in a box. I can't put myself in a box. I love to wear Adidas but I love to wear fur coats. I love to talk slang and hang out with my cousins in Chicago at a cookout, but I love to create opportunities and do what I need to do to elevate the platform of dance, which I didn't choose, it chose me for future generations to come. I am a firm believer that the body is the temple and this is uh, dance is one of the preeminent art forms to share history, to create history, to perpetuate the story of all peoples, no matter where you come from. Um, there's so much to talk about. Let me try to get back on my script because I am a nerd too. Uh, so I'm the daughter of Amy Moon, who changed her name to Nomura Tan whom I love so much, and she needs to hear it 1,000 times, who I love so much, who I love so much, who I love so much. To my father, Eugene Fulton, who was killed when I was an eight-year-old girl in Gary, Indiana, to gun violence, whom I love so much, who I love so much, who I love so much. Um, born in a Black arts movement. But who am I today, right? So I live in Washington, D.C. We're really in Silver Spring, Maryland and Washington, D.C. And I own the Princess Moon Dance Institute. We're celebrating 10 years. Whoa! <laughs> 10 years, so that's a big deal. We've survived everything, okay? And for our 10 year anniversary, I had planned on doing this really cool 
fundraiser gala where I had a student who I gave a scholarship to and her godfather was Wynton Marcellus and the mother was like, I'm hooking you up with Wynton. And we had this big gala plan an evening with Princess Moon and Wynton Marcellus. We we're gonna we we're gonna do this whole thing. And then COVID-19 set us all straight, didn't it? Right. I call it the what what did Alice Walker, somebody call it the pause, right? We have to reset, right? I've done so many things during this, but mainly. I've survived and thrived. And I rethought how we would celebrate the 10 years. And I think what I could share with you to give you an overview of my career and the work that I do that I love is to talk about what we're doing for our 10 year anniversary. We are celebrating 10 years. And so as creatives do, we need to create, I created a docu-series, a 10 part. And for each episode, I talk about how the steps and the things that added to my building blocks that are no different from anyone else's to help me get to 10 years as an arts educator, um, but also as someone who really believes in the power of dance. And um, the episode one is called Roots. It's on YouTube under Princess Moon Dance Institute. It talks about my early beginnings as a second generation artist. Um, I did research on my grandparents, my great grandparents, my parents, you know, I looked up, I started going through archives. So this is what, co so if you were not cleaning your house and your garage during COVID, if you weren't fasting, if you weren't meditating, shame on you. It was time to slow down and get everything in order. Okay. So I did that and I found my father's, um, portfolio before he died. And it said that Ray Nance, who played the trumpet and violin with Duke Ellington's band, is my great uncle. And he was a part of the composition of the A-Train. And it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. So I found that out about myself. So that wasn't in episode one. You just can't fit everything in it. Episode two is about my time at Howard University as a part of the first graduating class of dance majors of any HBCU. Episode three, which would be coming out this month, is about my inspiration, the dance icons who inspired me, the companies that I work with. Alayo Children's Dance Theater in Chicago, Muntu Dance Theater of Chicago, African-American dance ensemble founded by Chuck Davis, who is the founder of Dance Africa. Rennie Harris Pure Movement, preeminent uh, hip hop choreographer, Ronald K. Brown. Um, and there's so many more that I just need to pay homage to that allowed me to grace the stage with them. Um, I had an opportunity to do a project with a beautiful and amazing friend, Bridget Moore, called This Woman's Work that made top 25 to watch in Dance Magazine for highlighting women choreographers from diverse backgrounds. We, our first show was at the Merce Cunningham Theater, it was sold out. And I remember mailing everybody the invitation, the card, right? I mailed the Village Voice the card. I mailed Amsterdam News, the car. I did it myself and it was so much love that went into it. And people came back two and three nights in a row to see the, see the same show. And we were just blown away. Anyway, next episode is philosophy. Why I started the Princess Moon Dance Institute, the philosophy of it. I just, for me, I come from an old school background where I had choreographers who knocked the mess out of me in my face, in my head. Girl, you don't remember that? Throw a shoe at me, get you. And my philosophy when I opened my institute was a balance between serious study and fun. So we don't really hit our children. <laughs> we don't do that but we push them as hard as we can and we laugh with them and we help them find the joy of movement. And um, 
as we tr navigate through the pandemic, I think of us as frontline workers. For arts as a form of mental health, uh, for art, uh, for mental health um, therapy, uh, we are still open. So anyway, I we go through a couple of, I talk about my process. I am still a director and a choreographer. It is a juggling act. It's a serious juggling act, but I just said we all have many roles to play. And I step fully into my role and my calling and I have so much energy and I just kind of equated to that God had me here for a reason. He gave me all this energy for a reason, right? And Aww. so I use it until I just all the way pass out. <laughs> yes. and, then, and we'll be there to pick you up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's time for Sandra to come in. Okay. Miss Sandra, come on in. And we'll see you later, princess. Okay. <laughs> see you in a minute. Welcome, Dr. B. Please, in, please introduce yourself. I'm Sandra L. Burton, and it's a great pleasure to participate in Black Dance Stories this evening. Thank you, Charmaine. I am coming to you from um, Massachusetts, from Hancock, Massachusetts, the home of the original lands of the Mahican people, uh, and also a place where the Shakers who fled religious perse persecution in England to begin uh, colonies that worshiped um, in a different way in this part of the world. Uh, I am an African-American woman with salt and pepper dreads. And I am wearing today um, blue and white beaded large hoop earrings and uh, a deep turquoise, um, I would say velveteen shirt, um, scoop neck shirt. I'm coming to you from our family's favorite place, the kitchen, where all great things happen. But I have to tell you, I'm not one of our family's great cooks. That credit belongs to other people, but I do make a mean salad and wonderful cornbread. And I can set, thanks to my mother, a beautiful table. Surrounding me are books uh, because as a, as a dance teacher, I have to study and do research and school starts in two weeks. So I'm working on my courses and getting my readings together as well as my thoughts. Um, I would say that um, every day I, I start my day by anchoring myself in gratitude. What are the things that I'm grateful for? And I'm grateful for my family, which consists of the Burtons, the Kellys, and the, and the relatives therein. I am a Burton. I'm uh, the great granddaughter of Harriet Morgan, the granddaughter of Reverend Will and Essie Mae Burton, the daughter of Essie Mae Burton Land and, and Stephen Toon, the sister, the big sister of Patricia Grace Burton and the wife of the late Don Quinn Kelly, the um, stepmother of Mark Kelly, Nambi Kelly, David Kelly, the sister-in-law of John and Glenda, Edna, her Passel, the Passel in California, as well as um, I would say, um, one of my greatest joys is that I'm the grandmother of Xavier Kelly and Kaya Kelly. Um, uh, just today, my grandson called me and we parted by saying, I said, I'm lonely, baby. And he said, I'm lonely too, grandma. <laughs> we miss each other terribly. Uh, we miss each other terribly because for the first, because since, since the summer, I'm in this kitchen by myself. You know, what can I do? Um, so one of my daily gratitudes around family is to call my sister every day because she's in Virginia uh, and to spend time texting and emailing family. 
because I speak to my colleagues every day on Zoom. So this is a different type of pleasure. Another anchor of personal gratitude Gratitude for me is Camp Minisink, um, which is um, a place in, in Harlem and in Port Jervis, New York, where we no longer are, that my mother enrolled my sister and I in as we at, when we were little girls. And we grew up in Camp Minisink, and Camp Minisink is also one of the reasons why I am continuing to dance. I'm also really grateful for the neighborhood that we were raised in in Harlem and for our family farm in Virginia and for the plot of land and the home that our cousin Grace Lee uh, bought a long time ago that she passed on to our mother and that my sister resides in today. Virginia, Mecklenburg, Mecklenburg County, uh, tobacco, tobacco, Farming, <laughs> and um, I would say subsistence farming, working in lumber yards. Those are the kinds of things that that my family did. I had one uncle who went to college um, and and who became a high school history teacher and who was an, an, an educational instigator and prodder for myself and many of his nieces and nephews. I'm also really grateful for Clark Center. And I'm grateful for the fact that Alvin Ailey founded Clark Center in 1959, and that as a young dancer, I discovered it and fell under the tutelage of the late great Thelma Hill and James Truitt, Charles Moore, and many other people. Big up to Jill Williams, Ramona Candy, Sheila Rowan, and many others for keeping that legacy alive in the world. And of course, I'm grateful for Baba Chuck Davis, whose company I joined in 1972. And um, I would say that along with many other people, I'm still with him. I'm gonna be with him as my atoms go out into the universe. Uh, he raised me in many ways along with my family. Uh, I'm also grateful for LaGuardia High School, uh, where I majored in visual art because mommy didn't want me to, uh, you know, pursue that dance track because she felt like college was, had better be in my future. <laughs> um, I'm grateful for Long Island University and City College, um, where, where I did my undergraduate work. I'm grateful for the Schomburg Library because I spent many, many, many hours there and at the County Cullen Library and at the Washington Heights Library in our neighborhood, reading, checking out books and getting kicked out with a big stack of books. I'm also grateful for the Studio Museum in Harlem and for the artists there. I'm grateful for the New Lafayette Theater and for all and for Robert Macbeth and Ed Bullins and for all the actors, directors and writers who used to sit in front and talk to the dancers as we trotted up to Menacing Townhouse and then back down to 125th Street to take classes at uh, Olatunji Studio and to get on the subway and then proceed further downtown to the Clark Center for our lessons. I'm also grateful to the East for visionary, revolutionary culture and music. And I'm also grateful to Barbara Antier and the National Black Theater. Um, so those are streams um, that especially since COVID that I like, like to hold in my heart um, every day, uh, along with my family. Those are, um, I would say, my pillars, my anchors of, of gratitude in the world. Presently, where am I? I'm in my 38th year um, teaching at Williams College. Lord knows, I never thought it would happen, okay? Because teaching in an academic setting was not on my wish list of things to do. Why am I still here? Because of two people. <laughs> More, but there are two people who really instigated that. Baba Chuck Davis and the late great Thelma Hill. Um, Princess Moon mentioned, um, 
being uh, in a specific place at a specific time when Dr. King was assassinated. Oh no, it was Sharon who mentioned this. Well, I was at Clark Center in Horton class when we got the news that Dr. King had been assassinated. I was in Thelma Hill's class with a whole bunch of other, you know, like sister dancers. And all the black dancers ran to one side of the room and the white dancers ran to the other side of the room. And Thelma Hill put her hands on her hips and she looked at us. <laughs> and I won't repeat what she said, okay? However, it stuck with me what she said. It stuck with me. And it also stuck with me the way that she always counseled me along with Chuck to do more, to push myself to do more as a dancer and also to, um, I would say to go to school, you know, because every now and then, you know, you're coming across the floor and you're feeling yourself and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm bad. Okay, let me, she's like, nah, -uh. you know? Um, go ahead and do that audition. She, she'd, send, she'd send me on auditions. One of the things that I appreciated about her years later, when I'm sitting in this kitchen, she said to me one day, your generation has a lot of responsibility, Sandy. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, we gotta, you know, get those lateral T's together, those hinges. <laughs> Those bot moms. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, and you better finish school and you better be able to sit down and talk to any human being who needs to um, know something about dance because the future for your generation is to take dance forward in a different way. And I was floored by that. And I was like, why are you saying this to me? Why are you saying this to me? And then over the course of my living, I would say that I began to understand why she was saying that to me. I'm at Williams College because Chuck Davis received a residency here uh, in like 1981. And he brought with him um, Jalel Sharif, Sandra Burton, Quayal Adjapong. And it was our job to, you know, hunker down, especially Jalel and I, it was our job to hunker down and to um, teach dance in all the schools and organize a festival. And Chuck and Quayal would come in and out. Jalel and I had to live here. And we ran back to New York every weekend. So, over time, I said to myself, you know, this, I like it, but this isn't really, you know, this isn't really me. I like touring, I like teaching. I was running uh, Chuck's school in, you know, in, in, uh, in the Bronx. And what happened is, what ha happened is that the person who invited the company to be in residence, to do these residencies, retired. And the college um, noted that I had not put my name in the, you know, in the pool. And they called me in Brooklyn and said, you don't like us? And I was like, <laughs> like you, you know, they said, well, we're advertising this job. Why haven't you applied? And I said, because I, okay, maybe I should. <laughs> So I talked to my mom, I talked to Chuck and they, and they told me, you know, I, be, I better apply. And so I applied and I auditioned twice and, I'm, and 38 years later, I'm still here. Why am I still here? I'm still here because I love the people that I work with. I love the people who come into the classroom. The thing about teaching at a liberal arts college that doesn't have a dance major yet, which is we don't have one, is that you never know who's going to show up in your classroom. You never know what they're going to bring into the room and you don't know what they're going to do with that in the world. And I've lived to see people do great things with dance but also great things with science and education and law and economics and all kinds of things. So that's one thing 
that I value about um, working in education. I also continue to enjoy working in theater, but working in education uh, has given me a way to do, I would say, almost everything I'm capable of, which is choreograph, direct, think, research, write, talk to people, um, be informed by other people, be molded by other people, and to go home gratefully tired every day. But COVID has left grandma lonely. <laughs> I'm lonely, grandma. <laughs> Come on back, Sharon. Come on back, Princess. And as they're coming, Miss Sandra, there are a lot of people here. Let's just hear for y'all. I'm going to try to do this quickly. Heather Robles, Elizabeth Zimmer, Zonda. I'm not sure if I said that correctly. Sandy Sawatka, Rena Shagan, Janine Parker, Melanie Dixon, Stacy Dinner, Lavender Burns, Cynthia Oliver, Randall. Pippinger, Patricia Burton, Vincent Thomas, hey, Vincent Deva, Hank Smith, Laura Marchese, Courtney Myers, Sydney Polinchek, Maxine Montalas, Nambi Kelly, David Binder, Rob Held, Zell Bonnie, Anel Steele, Zane Booker, and Lara Gonzalez. A lot of fans, yo. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to leave you all for a little bit. Have fun, and I'll be back. <laughs> oh, this, <laughs> this is serious. This is serious. Oh, who's going first? I had so many thoughts when I was hearing you all talk. What when, thoughts were you having? Well, I was hearing Sharon talk, and I, well, the world is just one degree of separation, but sometimes you just don't cross paths with that one degree. And Sharon was an Ailey dancer. And I remember my years studying at the Ailey school. Um, and then Joyce Trisler, when you said that, that made me think about, oh, that's who Ron Brown danced with. And I danced with Ron Brown. And then Sharon, you also were with Chuck Davis. And then I came years behind you. So I was just, I was just thinking about the legacy and the lineage yeah. of who we are as mm -hmm. transplants or, you know, uh, biracial, biracial. <laughs> True. We are here. Yeah, I was thinking about that. And when I was listening to you talk about Mahon versus Moon versus mm. Your, your last name and how it could be Irish or it could be whatever. We are such a conglomeration of diversity. And I think for me, it's so important to celebrate diversity. It's, it's important to celebrate blackness, certainly. That's who we are, that, those are our roots. But there's so much that we have to share as a result of our homogenized lineage that makes us who we are and being able to tell these stories and not be embarrassed by it or not be ashamed of it. I, I mean, I think I know my grandfather was as a result of somebody in the, in the, the fields doing something to my great grandmother. And I mean, the stories that we pass down. Um, sometimes when our parents and our grandparents are sharing, they leave out certain things. Mm -hmm. And then as you get older, you figure it out. You go, oh my goodness. As that means goodness. that grandpa was not, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, know what you're, I know what you're saying. Um, because um, one of the, one of the funny things um, in the Burton family is my my grandfather looked like Wesley Snipes, but my grandmother, you know, would look like you, if you passed her on the street, you would think that she was a white woman, right? But mm -hmm. she, she wasn't, okay? Because her mother was a black woman, great grandma Harriet, okay? Um, but her father was. 
but we were never told that story. Yeah. Okay. We were never told that story. And I know that my sister will remember my sister and I, my sister is darker than I am. But if you look at us, you see that we are sisters mm -hmm. and we both look like our family. And we're very proud of that. But the arc of color in our family goes from light to very dark. And so grandma is out with her grandchildren and, and white people, not black people, white people are looking at her, at her like she crazy. Because, you know, like, you know, little color babies and grandma, look, grandma, grandma, grandma. And, you know, um, but in our community, you know, no, you know, that was, she was our grandma and everybody knew it. Yep. You know, everybody knew it. I think that's, that's true for most of us that the, uh, the intermarrying or not even marrying the interconnection between the slave owner and the people that are the slaves. And then we are the progeny. And mm -hmm. I know my mom was very light skinned. And my father was very dark skinned and I couldn't not like dark people and I could not like white people or light, really white looking people. So I never grew up understanding the disparity in terms of how people hated blacks or how they hated whites. And yet now as an almost 76 year old woman, the tragedies that we are witnessing as African American people is so devastating. And it, 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 for me, I think it must mirror what happened in the 60s yeah. and even before that in the 20s and even before that when slavery was in existence, the demands and humanity demand. And that's what we're talking about. And mm -hmm. to, to get it back on track as far as dance is concerned, we can express so much through movement and it can be felt by people of any color, any gender, any race. Mm -hmm. And it, that's the beauty of it. To me, that's the beauty. Mm -hmm. We're not speaking down to anyone. We're communicating through spirit, through love, through movement. And it is so freeing. I remember saying to one of my students, I can be having the worst day in the world and I can go into the classroom and teach an hour and a half class. And in that hour and a half, everything is wonderful because you don't think about anything else other than what you're doing and the love you have for it and the connection you have with your students. I'm sure both of you feel the same way. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wanted to say something. My inclination is to just really be quiet and to listen and to talk to you all. Um, I am the, the, the daughter of this group. Um, I, I just want to say thank you for who you are, for what you represent, and whether it's one degree of separation and we're just meeting in 2021, thank you. Um, and so my inclination is to just listen and learn, but a few things came to mind and just three things I wanted to say. The first thing is I want to say thank you to Black Dance Stories because in the African tradition, we don't necessarily write everything down, right? We talk, we dance, we create visual art. And so this is a way for us to create our own living history. And I'm, I'm excited and I'm an honored to be a part of it. And then I was also thinking about um, what you were saying, what the both of you were saying, just the combined history. Black dance stories is really human dance stories, right? Because yes, there's a part of us that came from Africa, but there's a part of us that was born here and the cultural cultural traditions were, they derived right and they were born right here on this earth. And I was just so funny. I'm sitting in my office and my mom sent me, she did this, uh, she did an ancestry DNA for me as a gift. I need to swab and send it back. 
But she said, oh, we have Nigerian. Oh, we have some Swiss. Oh, we have some this and we have some that. And a couple of weeks ago, I was with some family and we were discovering Italian and Irish and meeting people for the first time. But the last thing I wanted to say is that as we look and think about the transatlantic slave trade and how we were not allowed to dance and they called dancing the slaves on those ships, mm -hmm. making us jump up and down, right? And the spirit was void, right? They were just exercising us and we got to those plantations and we snuck and we recreated, we juba jigged and we cakewalked. And, the ring shout. And we ring shouted, <laughs> right? And those are the things that just kind of resonated, resonated with me and came to mind, but I just wanted, I want to do less talking and more listening, but I wanted to say those things that are just passing and say also just thank you. And it's my honor to meet you, Sharon oh. and Sandra. Nice to meet you too, nice to meet you. Uh, Princess. You are, I would say, um, a dance niece because I was in Chuck's company in New York, and you were in the one uh, in, in in North Carolina. Yes, uh, yes. So it's a pleasure to to meet you um, this way. I, I would say that one of the things that um, that moves me about dance, which which um, Sharon was talking about, and you were talking about, is that. Um, you know, people say it's ephemeral, you know, you do it and it's gone. Um, well, that there's that one aspect of it, but I believe that dance, um, that dance, the spirit of dance and also the memory of dance is carried from body to body, from spirit to spirit across time and across generations. Uh, and the community of artists uh, and of dancers, you talked, you talked, uh, um, uh, Princess, about your parents being a part of the Black arts movement. Well, I've been around long enough to have participated in that. And it, it, it taught me a lot. Uh, it connected me to um, so many ways of thinking and being. Um, I, I said that I grew up in Camp Minnesink in, in, a, in a strong Black family. Camp Minnesink anchored intentionally anchored black children in pride of self so that you could go into the world as your black self <laughs> okay and feel equal and be equal and act equal and be a part of the world and so my my teaching along with my colleagues um at williams is to really um try to, um, I would say, encourage all human beings who come into the classroom to unlock their best self, um, to, to, to tap into that spirit that you, um, that you were both talking about and to the possibility that the intelligent body will connect with the intelligent spirit and grow. Uh, and 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 therefore cause other incredible things to happen. Um, yeah. Whenever I step into a classroom, um, I remember that I'm not in there alone. You know that <laughs> that I'm like you know even especially when I'm feeling like crappy. Like I remind myself that I'm not in there alone. That I'm carrying Thelma Hill and Chuck Davis you know, and Walter Raines, and, you know, and so many incredible, incredible, incredible people into the room with me. Um, and, and it helps. Mm -hmm. And I think we feel an obligation based on the Thelma Hill, of course, Donald McHale, Alvin Ailey, you did the, the list goes on and on. But think about the fact that they gave us what they what their joy, what their passion, what their training gave them. And now we have an obligation, but it's not a, it's not a bad obligation. It's, it's a sense of passing down or passing the torch to the next generation. I think Princess is that generation. <laughs> and she will continue to pass it down to the next one. And that's the joy of dance is that we pass it on, 
I, I don't want to offend anybody, but we pass it on not through Zoom or technology, <laughs> but being one-on-one -on -one in the classroom, having that ability to touch a person's mind, body, and spirit. And that I don't think that you can, I may be wrong, so please forgive me. I don't think you can effectively, efficiently, really from the visceral part of your being, give that over technology. I think being in the classroom or being on a stage with those dancers, with those students, gives them and gives us a sense of the real meaning of what to dance is. You speak in truth. <laughs> hey. Obviously, obviously we should touch on this. And I hate using the word pivot, but this Zoom thing, y'all. Aaron <laughs> has a school. Sandra's, Dr. Sandra's upstate princess. I think Sharon talked a little bit about that. Maybe you, Princess and Dr. Burton, could talk a little bit more about, oh boy, your head is to the side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, um, this is, um, I, I, I said before, the, um, before we um, began this, is that I definitely count myself as a person who's technologically challenged um, because I am most comfortable, um, at, as Sharon was describing, when I am in the room with other people. Um, I can feel the energy, I can read their body, I can see the sweat, I can tell if I'm being effective or not. Um, I can do a 360 around them. This has been, um, this has been a real challenge for me and, uh, and what it's forcing me to do is to, is to learn more and to try to work in different ways, which there's a part of me that is resistant to because I feel like I can't reach through mm. and see, I can't turn around you. I can't put your shoulders down. Oh. Um, and and I, I long for that. Um, I, I, I long for that and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. But I am grateful for Zoom technology because it has allowed us to stay connected to our work. It's allowed us to stay connected to each other as colleagues. And it's allowed some of our students who are in foreign countries, as well as in this country, in different situations to stay connected to learning uh, and creating together. We've had to try to find new ways, um, you know, to, to, to make things happen and sometimes we just talk, yeah. you know, especially yeah. in, in the, the company, you know, the company that I direct. Sometimes I look at them and I can tell that this one is coming with a story. Mm -hmm. You know, this one is coming with a heartache. <laughs> you know, this one is coming with too much Zoom for today. And, and, and I have to adjust and like say, okay, we're not going to do this, we're going to do this, you know. Um, and that's a different type of reading. You know, sometimes I find myself <laughs> like that. <laughs> How about you, Princess? And what's the age at the school? So um, we begin at the age two, at age two, but we have a hybrid program. So we are online. You can choose to be online or in person, but I also am on faculty at American University. So it is really, it's a, the dichotomy between respecting the past and the, the need and the really the fundamental human communication of exchanging mm -hmm. information and moving forward into technology, which is kind of a global trend, right? If we want to advance as mm -hmm. a world and be a world, you know, to be technical technologically advanced, right? It's a dichotomy. And, and I have a staff where there's lots of millennials and I have one person, she cannot stand to pick the phone up and call customer service. <laughs> it literally gives her the heebie-jeebies. And I'm like, girl, if you call them, you might get an answer right now, baby girl, okay? But 
we, this is the world we're in. And it's really, it's a dichotomy, right? And what I found myself, so I don't teach at my institute as much. I mm -hmm. only choreograph, I have a staff, but at the university I teach and I found myself mothering more than anything. Yeah. Bringing them into the space, doing a temperature check and to how they're doing emotionally because they don't understand the effects of tech. There is an effect of techno mm -hmm. technology and we are addicted and we sink into depression. There is something about not exchanging energy with each other. Yeah. That is the, that is the, it is the, that's the one thing if we don't exchange, because sometimes you just got to pull on somebody else's energy mm -hmm. and I'm not trying to be all out there, but it's true. Yeah. You might not have it for yourself that particular day. So I found myself mothering a lot. Mm. Found myself like Sharon, Sandra is saying, okay, today we're just going to talk. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because you can't, you can't adjust the shoulders. You can't say the pelvis should be this way. You can't give them the energy and the nuance of the feeling and the expression and the articulation that is in the spine that is going to be read, right, as language. So that's my, my take on it. This too shall pass. You know, <laughs> like my grandmother Juanita Moon says, this too shall pass. We're just kind of all doing the best we can. We yeah. are, they are, the government is, mm -hmm. the ancestors are, we're all doing the best we can. We were all laughing before we got on camera about the different, the different, it's not techniques. What is it called? Oh my gosh. Genres? Huh? The genres? No, not the genres. Graham, Horton. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're called techniques. The techniques. Techniques. Yeah. Oh gosh, I don't know what just happened. <laughs> but can you go back to that conversation? I don't even know what the question is. But <laughs> I think, Dr. Sandra, you went one way and then Sharon went, oh, Horton. And then Princess, <laughs> I don't know what the question is. But remember that? Yeah, I, I think we do we were, remember. Yeah, we did a. I I, I think Sharon did a a, a a gesture. Yeah, and you know we started <laughs> you know doing you know laterals and you know all the, all the <laughs> things you know the things that we have to do and <laughs> and just um like I have um, colleagues who um who are who have been really doing an amazing job um, bringing the technology uh, into the classroom and teaching in a, a hybrid way. Um, and I'm gonna try a little bit of, of that this semester, but as a, as a, as a 73 year old black woman, you know, <laughs> I, I'm really cautious about going into the studio space, even masked up, you know, and, and, and maintaining the social distancing yeah. Just really because um, I say to myself, um, uh, I have a lot of responsibilities, you know, um, I, and and so I have to, you know, like I have to gauge. However, what I think may come out of this period, and and Princess, you alluded to this, is some new something, hybrid something. Um, this this situation has allowed. Uh, has allowed, I would say, um, our department to reconnect with alums that, you know, I thought we had lost contact with mm -hmm. totally in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we started having these Sunday salons uh, where people like drop in <laughs> from all over the planet, uh, Peru, you know, Benin, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and just talk and now we've gotten to the place where um, one person presents their work uh, and, and people discuss it. You know, we have one coming up this Sunday. That has been something that the young people who've graduated out of our program started doing in March. Hmm. And they've done it every month, sometimes multiple times since wow. last March. And that has been 
such a profound, you know, it's been a profound thing um, to happen. Uh, and and that, that would have taken longer to happen without COVID. Do you know what I mean? It would have, it, it wouldn't have happened in the way, in the organic way. Um, people started having a need to reach out to people that maybe they had forgotten about mm -hmm. uh, and, and to scratch around and, and, and see, oh, you know, where's, you know, where's Charmaine? Where's, yeah. where's Sharon? Where's Princess? You know, yeah. um, and, and that's been, that's been a tremendous gift. So maybe, so maybe the silver lining is that we've created these digital or web-based villages where if we weren't if we weren't able to see each other because we weren't down the street we can kind of zoom <laughs> hit the zoom link and see each other <laughs> board meetings are a lot easier on zoom than they used to be when you had to actually go into a meeting somewhere with both bottoms and tops on now you just have to dress from the top up but sure and miller <laughs> Well, you know what I'm saying. But I was looking at Princess, and when she was talking, she uses her hands so beautifully. And I was thinking, that's also kind of coming from this Zoom phenomenon where we're really isolated on, on a tile, a, a, a screen tile. And we can only express so much laterally and front and back. Yeah. And so everything is getting all up into the upper body. And I'm thinking, you were talking about technique. I mean, there was the Graham technique, the Lamont technique, the Horton technique. And then that became the Paul Taylor technique, which was really yeah. Lamont technique. I mean, <laughs> and what really happens is that we each generation makes a technique their own mm -hmm. and i think we're going to superimpose this technological mm -hmm. whatever this is time wow onto the techniques that the isolations because we're we're dealing with lateral uh, axial movement we're having to sort of stand still so we're going up and down we're isolating shoulders we're isolating rib cages which we used to do in other techniques but we were moving across the floor at the same right. time. So now we're not sort of doing that, but I think it's kind of going to emerge into another dynamic technique. Yeah. And let's see what happens. All right, I have one question and I think all of you can do this. And of course it's, we're almost out of time, but Vincent Thomas, who will be on in a week or I can't remember. But Vincent Thomas will be on. He says, when you look at your footprint now, what is one thing your eyes will see? That's deep. Children. Say that again, Sharon. Children. The hope of the future. I hope to see um, a more deeply rooted place for dance in the education of every human being in every educational system across the planet. Okay, I see. That's a, that's a loaded question. God. It is. But look what your elders already said. Oh, wow. <laughs> they come with it, right? <laughs> if I look at my footprint, what do I see? I think I see a full circle, right? Creative artist, educator, scholar, keeper of the flame, mm. passer of the torch. That's what I see. Wow. Mm. Mm. This here, there are so many shout outs in the chat. <laughs> I hope you all will go and listen to the chat, read the chat. 
afterwards, but the, there's so many shout outs. People are here, they're sending the love. They're lifting you up as they should. And you all were our guinea pigs for tonight. <laughs> and, and it was an amazing night. Thank you for your brilliance, your wisdom, and your contribution to dance. We are better for it. Thank you. Thank you. That's some name dropping. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> right? I love it. I love it. You better. Oh my gosh. History. Teach. Makita, which name didn't you know? I. You got me on the spot. <laughs> I know. I didn't mean to do it. Uh... Oh. <laughs> name that I didn't that I didn't recognize if I didn't know completely the like history of the name I've heard before I'm well I'm very immersed because of my mother that's right so but yeah that's my answer and, that's on the <laughs> and, and as I was saying it her mom is Nia Love who's also watching and as I was saying it I'm thinking I'm thinking oh Makita performed on the Thelma Hill. <laughs> what was the title of it? Thelma Hill yearly series with her mama. Wow. Yeah, but so many names. Joyce Trisler. Look, and I'm the forever student. I'm always taking notes, like the forever student. Aww. I'm proud of you for that, Princess Moon. <laughs> you made your your mama your school mama proud. <laughs> <laughs> For those who, out there who don't know, Princess was one of my students when I taught at Howard. H U U U. <laughs> so long ago. <laughs> so beautiful performer educators. Did we forget anything? Is there something that you'd like to drop another bomb as if you haven't already? Yeah, I would drop a bomb that when Charmaine was getting her uh -oh. masters and was doing her dissertation defense, I was also getting my masters. And <laughs> I thought I was like doing something because I was getting a master's in history with my professor who I loved and learned so much from at the same time and we both had research material oh. in African diasporic Caribbean African American dance topics and I'm so thankful that we we got it at Howard so we thankful got it at Howard yes man I'm so glad I got my my PhD at Howard just saying yeah, mm. she was pregnant with Charmaine and I was there for her and that we were oh. yes, with Ashe. I'm sorry. Same thing, Ashe, Charmaine. <laughs> and Sharon was, dot, 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 say it, Sharon. I was Ashe's teacher. <laughs> small world. It, it's really small world. I want to drop one thing and yep. that is that Sharon Miller's Academy for the Performing Arts is celebrating 25 years. So when you said 10 years, uh, Princess, I, I hearkened back to that 10th year. And I never would have thought there would have been 25. But keep on going, keep on doing, keep on teaching. It's You're sharing something really special. A lot of people don't understand it yet, but they will. So you got to keep on going. Yes, yes. Dr. B? Oh, um, I, I would just say that I'm gonna add this. This program is added to my anchors of gratitude. Um, oh. Yeah, um, it's really because um, this is an important contribution to the legacy and, um, and, and, and it's lifted my spirit um, in a way, I meant what I said when I said that my, my grandson and I were talking this afternoon and our parting words to each other, I said, grandson, I'm lonely. And he said, grandma, I'm lonely too. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because we, 
uh, we have family, we have rituals of things that we do together and, and we haven't been able to do that. And so um, this time with you all um, and knowing that this is here is at, it's adding to my, you know, anchor of gratitude. Um, thank, thank you all for this. We mean it when we say happy Black Dance Stories Thursday, man. Mm. We miss our friends, our, yeah. Well. Thank you, Charmaine. Yes, thank you, Charmaine. Thank you all, thank you and all. Kimani and Makada and Renee and everybody who makes this happen. Yeah. Right back at you all. Thank you. My, yes, yes, yes. And I also want to give a last reminder to everybody that's watching to like and comment on this video, to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can see more beautiful conversations that we are having, happy, having on Thursdays that's like right. this. <laughs> and follow us on our social media so that you know, let's grow this beautiful community and mm -hmm. bringing in these wonderful artists and educators and Black people in the dance community. Next week is Toria Beard, Vincent Thomas, and Deidre Dawkins. So save the date next Thursday. We'll see you then. All right, everybody. As always, going out there and get into some good trouble good trouble good trouble good, trouble. good night